Last session, I gave you a flavor of what linguistics is about and what we shall cover this and in the following term. Now today, we will look more closely at what the properties of language are. As I said, we all speak a language, probably more than one, we all do so fluently and efficiently, um, but there are actually a couple of points which you might not have thought of ever before. Um, and those are the kind of things that give you an idea also for how to approach the structure sessions because of the structural properties of language that we're going to discuss today. Okay. When we start doing linguistics, um, I think the best starting point is actually Ferdinand de Saussure. He's dead, he was Swiss, so why do we start with him? Um, the thing is, people call him the founding father of modern linguistics because he was the first one to really think about this idea of language as a system. And he didn't stop there, he also wondered, well, what's the system made up of? How do systems work? And what does that mean for language? Um, the approach that he had is simple. It consists of two simple tests of how to find out um, what the stuff is of the system and how they correlate. Uh, and we will see this pattern over and over again in the various sessions on phonetics, on phonology, syntax, semantics, and so on. So the first question that we're going to look at is the system bit. And I don't think he gave the precise definition, but the definition of language as a system of arbitrary vocal symbols, something I've given you last week, um, at least the ideas can be traced back to Saussure. And so, obviously, with that definition, there are two things which we sort of still have to figure out. What exactly does it mean if we speak of language as a system? And what are arbitrary vocal symbols that he mentions? Okay. What Saussure said is that a system, and the definition is going to look complex, um, has ordered internal relations. That's even in lay terms, if we speak about something being a system, being systematic, we assume that there is structure, relationships, things going on b between stuff. Uh, and the fact that it has got structure also gives the name to that specific school of linguistics, which is, surprisingly, structuralism. Now, any kind of system is also going to consist of stuff, units. Um, simple units that we all know that language consists of are words. But these do not sort of exist independently, okay? Uh, it's not that cat, bin, desk, people and so on are just randomly floating in the air. We pick them out, they've got relationship. Uh, semantic ones, for example, that if I say furniture, then in the top of your mind you, you're probably thinking, well, sofa, chair, um, duvet or whatever. Uh, and if I think uh, cooking utensils, um, then you might think about it, a spoon or a ladle, uh, a pot, uh, a pan, that kind of thing. Okay? So we associate things with each, other, with, each, with each other. There is a structure to those words. And the main point of this system idea is that you've got individual units, and we will see how to find them, a very simple procedure. And then we've got to ask ourselves, what's the role of that with respect to other units that can do the same job or that do different jobs? The next couple of slides are just examples, okay? We're not doing biology or um, anything else. But the thing is, systems exist everywhere. And the idea that you've got units and how they act applies to many things. This is the sympathetic and parasympathetic um, nervous system. It's what the impulses that your brain gives, and there are two separate systems, so to speak. If one is activated, um, then, for example, with the parasympathetic ones, you're a bit more laid back, like the Jita there. Um, your eyes are a bit more open. Um, I'm going to check that myself. I think di digestion goes down um, and several other things, okay? So the system, obviously, in your body consists of several organs and of these um, nerve strings, and they have got certain jobs. Um, the sympathetic system, for example, will um, cause your heart rate to go up, to be more alert, um, so that you can flee um, if a dangerous situation comes up. Um, but it still consists of those different systems um, and the relationship that this um, nervous system has with the organs. A different system is a portable CD radio cassette recorder. I don't know what with iPods these days, it might be a bit of an anachronism. <laughs> but um, back in them days, people had those, uh, and they put CDs in there, and tapes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and again, you know, it's a system. Um, there are individual elements, there are buttons, radio buttons, things you can, knobs you can turn and so on, things you can press. 
Uh, and all of these do a job. Okay? Some of the, the, the buttons are arranged up here, for example, okay? and they all operate um, the tape recorder um, and the cassette player. And each of these units has a different function, stop, play, and so on. Okay? But obviously, these have a function that is more similar than, I don't know, the, the on or off volume, which just um, starts the whole thing or, or turns it off. Okay? Unless, okay, I really hope no one will ask this question, but no, this is not going to appear in the final test. Okay? Um, but the thing is, just to give you an idea, okay? there are systems, and all you've got to remember is they consist of stuff, and the stuff, um, the units, have different functions. I'm just waiting for ghosts to appear. <laughs> that would be another system, okay? That's by an artist from the Tate Gallery just looking at um, what future life might be like, okay? A completely different system. Um, all I'm showing you is that there are lots of different systems and they look completely different, they do completely different things, but they always work the same way. You've got units and they've got relationships with each other. For example, in here, you've got the humans living there. They're part of the system. Um, you seem to have something like rooms which are connected, there are roads connecting uh, the different flats or whatever that is. So despite the fact that this is new and there's also a roof which lets in air, which probably comes in handy. Um, so all of these things are again units and they work together to keep everyone alive and going. Okay. So as I said, now, Cecile wasn't worried about tape recorders or the nervous system or whatever, but he liked the idea of language as a system, okay? that we just look at it and look at its structure. Um, and that's the school called structuralism, um, which sort of informs the first lecture in the winter term. Um, okay. So how do we find the units? Now, that at first might sound like a trivial question. We always said there are words. But the thing is, how do you know that something's a word? Okay? And is cat and cat two different words? I mean, they look different, they sound different, um, if only minimally so. Um, um, but I don't know, sit and kit also differ only by one sound, and they're completely different. Um, so how do we know that? And at the bottom line, the one thing you can look at is you've got a structure like I like linguistics. Right? That is what I want. Um, and you can substitute things. Okay. If you've identified something and you put something else in there and it still sort of makes sense, then you've identified units. Because units, especially those which have got a similar job, um, all appear in the same slot. That's the idea. So you could say, I like linguistics, or you could say, I love or hate linguistics. Okay? As I said, this, it, it is as simple as that. It's not going to be limited to the word level. It also will uh, play a major role with the sounds and the syntax, but that's one of the simple stuff. It's called paradigmatic, a uh, bit of Greek. Um, in essence, it means choice or substitution. We find units by substituting elements in one slot. Or if you're the visual type, you know, um, it's the vertical relationship. All things that can go in a similar slot. On the other hand, uh, syn, together, uh, syntagmatic relationships, or chain, or combination, whatever you call it, looks at once we've got these units via substitution, we can ask ourselves, what are these doing together in a row, so to speak? What are the functions of the different buttons on the tape recorder? Okay? Uh, start, stop, pause, play, and so on. They're all next to each other, and they've got different functions, and you've got to know where to, where to click, so to speak. Um, with respect to language, a very simple and uh, effective illustration of syntagmatic relationships is third-person singular agreement in English. There's not an awful lot of... Um, those kind of um, syntactic markings, trying to keep it as um, theory neutral as possible uh, in English. But you know, you've got to say in Spanish, English, I like linguistics and he likes linguistics. So the form of the verb, a unit, a slot which we've identified because we substituted it and we know that other verbs can go into it, um, depends on the form of the subject. Subject verb agreement, as it is called, um, or the classic um, sort of rule of thumb, he, she, it, es muss mit. Okay? But that's a different type of relationship. It's not one that sort of just exchanges stuff in one slot. It looks at which units can co-occur. So paradigmatic, you substitute stuff that goes in the same slot. Those seem to function as units. And if you've got the units, you can ask which of those go together? Which of those form a gang? And what does that tell us about language? 